Good morning. Welcome back to the Pellet Wern Lecture Series. And I see a lot of you have made it to the refreshments table, but if not, feel free to help yourself there and to some coffee as we get started here. We want to say thanks this morning to the people that have provided our refreshments, uh, all under the direction of Deborah Schneider. Uh, we want to say thanks to Sarah Seaborn, Debbie Kaiser, Karen Caudell, and Mary Beck, who have provided these, as well as we should pretty much every week should say thanks to Tony and Howard, who are always at work making our, our plans come together in the kitchen. So um, thanks to all of you for participating in that. Um, as we begin uh, our next to last lecture, this week and next week, as we continue through um, this series with uh, Dr. Brian Bibb of Furman University, um, taking us through reflections on the way the Bible comes to us in translation. Uh, we're going to consider some new and upcoming uh, translations today. But as we do, let us bow together for a prayer. Lord, you have said, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And this we trust, that your word is living and active in the many forms in which it comes to us and will accomplish our salvation and the salvation of the world. We thank you that your word is beyond our control and yet that we can hear it and even understand it in our own human language. In this hour of reflection, open us to this mystery and truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brian Bibb, welcome back. All right. Good morning, everyone. Am I on? Okay. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here with you again this morning. And I'm happy to say that we've made it to the here and now. As you know, if you've been following these lectures, we spent the first couple of weeks on historical issues, tracing the history of the biblical text in the ancient period, the study of Greek and Hebrew manuscripts in the medieval and the modern period. We talked about the history of the Bible in English. This led to a conversation about the methods that translators use and a few of the controversial topics that translators face as they um, produce modern Bibles. I'm going to be returning a little bit to some of those controversies today, especially the question of gender in translation. The point that we've come to it again and again is very simple in a way. Translation is work done by people, right? And so to understand the nature of the translated Bible, we have to understand the work done by those people. Where and when do they work? For whom are they working? What are they trying to accomplish? What are their goals? What are their concerns? What are their assumptions as they work? The decisions that they make literally create the Bible that other people use. And so I think that the more thoughtful and transparent and critical we can be about that process of biblical creation, the better. So in this lecture today, I'm going to focus on two questions that I think are related. First, what is the current state of Bible translation? That is, what are the conditions and the dynamics that continue to shape translation in 2018 right now? And second, what will the Bible become? What are the emergent trends in Bible translation? And how are they connected to changes in the nature of language and culture? Changes in the nature and status of the Bible itself as a cultural project. I'll explain what I mean by cultural project in a moment. So first, I want to make a point. It says, um, it seems to me that when we talk about the creation and publication of the Bible today, how the Bible is translated, what form it takes, what the Bible is, that this is the work of people we might call gatekeepers and ambassadors. Gatekeepers and ambassadors. Gatekeepers are those who are in a position to define who we are, what counts, what matters. Every group has gatekeepers. And ambassadors 
are those people who are in a position to represent who we are to the outside world. Together, gatekeepers and ambassadors have control over the definition of and the perception of our identity, of what is true and what is good, who we are. So in the history of the Bible, then, powerful individuals, this is in the ancient world and in the modern world, powerful individuals and groups and organizations have had a decisive role in creating the Bible as it is. Now, this is not a very profound truth, I don't think, but it's easily taken for granted. Think for a minute about your first experience reading the Bible. Did you have a Bible that was given to you by a family member? Raise your hand if your first Bible was given to you by family. Who had their first Bible given to them by church? Right? Does this church give Bibles to like fourth graders, like every fourth grade class? That's very common. Third grade. When I was in the Baptist church, you would get a Bible when you were baptized. My Bible was a living Bible. It had a picture of Jesus holding a lamb on the front of it. Think about that first Bible that you were given or perhaps that you bought. Where did it come from? It was a published book. It was designed and packaged and sold by a company, sometimes for profit, often for profit. When people, when we say that there are people creating the Bible, these people in question are not just translators, right? They are CEOs and project managers And copywriters and designers and editors and marketers and sales representatives and so on. If you go to the Christian bookstore, better go quick because they're closing. Or to the Christian section of a large bookstore, also go quick. You will see that there is a stunning variety of Bibles available. They're tailored to particular genders and ages and professions and theological preferences and color Style preferences. The executive director of the Society of Biblical Literature, his name is John Kutzko, and he was, before he became the ED of SBL, uh, which is a very important position in my field, he was in Bible publishing for years. And he told me that he realized he needed to get into a different job in the middle of an hours long meeting about which Bible covers would look the best with women's Sunday clothes. From the text and the paratext, that's anything that's in the book that's not part of the biblical text, to the color of the cover, Bibles are produced for consumers. And from the text to the appearance, they bear the stamp of that market pressure. Publishers, then, do serve that function of gatekeepers and ambassadors. They decide which translations will be published, in what markets, how much they will cost, They decide what theological perspectives will be included in the paratextual material. They take the Bible products that meet their market research and then spread them out to the world. Increasingly, that ambassadorial service takes place in an online space. There are websites such as YouVersion, which is run as a a nonprofit Christian ministry. And then there is the Zondervan-owned BibleGateway.com. Um, these provide access to many translations all at once, many, largely for free. The way that these sites are designed, their interface, their presentation, the way that they are accessed and by whom, these things have a large impact on the way that readers encounter the Bible and are therefore part of this ambassadorial definition of what the Bible is. There's a related issue that's recently in the news, um, at least if you read the Bible Geek News that I do, um, are you familiar with the dot .bible domain? It's called a TLD. Like we have dot .com, dot .org, right? There are a bunch of new ones, and one of them is dot .bible. The Internet Registrar, I can, subtracted with the American Bible Society to run the dot .bible set of domains in 2014. On their landing page, get.bible, They encourage groups to purchase Bible domains with the promise of, quote, instant association with the Bible and strengthen your brand with Bible URLs. Their website has a series of articles about the value of short domain names and search engine optimization. They have one article titled Six Smart Ways to Rebrand with Authority While Being Memorable, which promises that dot Bible addresses are, quote, the perfect domains for Bible churches and, quote, branding for Bible translations. 
Now, this arrangement means that the American Bible Society, 200-year-old organization, but uh, recently much more evangelical than they were before, has the power to decide which sites can be approved for dot .bible designation. They agreed in their contract with ICANN to be non-discriminatory. However, they very quickly enacted a policy that says that any, I'm going to read this so I get it right, any site will be denied the dot .bible designation if, quote, it espouses or promotes a religious, secular, or other worldview that is antithetical to New Testament principles, including but not limited to the promotion of a non-Christian religion or set of religious beliefs. Last fall, a group of Jewish scholars objected to that restriction, saying, well, this is anti-Jewish. So they changed the policy to allow Jewish sites, but they continue to reject any site that, quote, advocates belief in any religious or faith tradition other than Orthodox, Orthodox Christianity or Judaism. They prohibit, quote, any content that communicates disrespect for God as he is revealed in the Bible, as well as, quote, any content that communicates disrespect for the Bible. Now, the Internet is a public resource. Should follow non-discrimination policies, I think. Should it be up to the American Bible Society to reject any site that is critical of the Bible? Or that maybe takes an academic approach that Christians might consider to be against their theological beliefs? As scholars, we know that there is not simply one Bible. Which Bible you mean is ambiguous. Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, Jeffersonian. As a scholar, we know that the study of non-canonical texts in ancient Judaism are absolutely essential for understanding the Bible. Books like First Enoch or the Gospel of Thomas. Also, we know that the academic study of the Bible is critical in the academic sense, meaning it uses critical faculties, but also can be critical in the normal sense. Uh, just this week, I taught a class about how uh, feminists uh, read against patriarchal language in the prophets for the purposes of deconstructing oppressive uses of the Bible in modern context. Right, that's critical of the Bible. Is there a place for any of this in dot Bible? No, because the ABS is the gatekeeper and the ambassador. They get to define what the Bible is and by extension who gets to read what about it? These gatekeepers and ambassadors play a profound role in creating the Bible. Since we know that they are people who work in particular cultural, religious, political contexts, that makes the Bible at a fundamental level a cultural object. No, it's more complex than that. It's a cultural project. So... Um, let me pause there for a moment and see if, if there are any questions about the dot Bible or what I mean when I say that the Bible is a cultural project, uh, gatekeepers and ambassadors. Any quick questions before we move along? Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I have a, an article that I wrote uh, called From Scroll to Screen, which is about that phenomenon. And in that, I argue that what's happened now that we have this hypertext uh, way of accessing the Bible, that it destroys any sense of canonical context. We're going to look at a couple of examples coming up of where online projects take the Bible and just t- completely take it out of its canonical context and do all kinds of weird things with it because of the technology. So you're right. Well, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Certainly. Now, yeah, you might gain some things, but I do think you also lose a lot. Good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> They're working, working on it. I mean, they are working on it. I mean, it's much better than it was three years ago. But you can check the state of artificial translation by going to the Google Translate, take a paragraph, put it into, say, English to German, take the, archi- the German that comes out and put it in the German to English and see what you get. Right. So. Oh, yes, yeah. So th- we have a long way to go. Um, 
It just gives you a sense of how amazing the human brain is. We talked about the miracle. That translation is a miracle. Right? I mean, the computers are not quite at miraculous levels yet. <laughs> I think there's some sci-fi movies about that. When that, the Borg and whatnot. I want to um, now follow a thread that was cut short a bit in last week's lecture. The role of gender politics in contemporary Bible translation. Now... Many of you remember this, but beginning in the early 1990s, there was a big debate about gender in theological language. I was a student at Furman in the early 90s when we started using the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which makes changes such as having Paul address brothers and sisters instead of brethren, or God creating humankind instead of mankind. When I went to Princeton Seminary in 1994, the official policy was to avoid masculine language in all theological writing. For people or God. We, re, we learn to reword sentences to avoid calling God he in our papers and our sermons and our liturgical prayers. It's not easy because English doesn't have good neuter pronouns. We're moving to the plural they and them, but that, even that doesn't really work for God. Inconveniences aside, by the early, by, I'd say by the late 90s, the tide had turned. Even to the extent that some evangelical translations were thinking about gendered language. The New International Version, which was at that time and still the most popular evangelical translation, created a revision, which I bet nobody here has heard of, maybe you have, called the NIV Inclusive. It was published in 1996 in the UK and incorporated gender nonspecific wording for people and uh, to some degree for God. Evangelicals in the United States lost their minds, <laughs> criticizing it as the politically correct Bible that had been taken over by feminists. I think feminazis was the word we, that people used back in the, those Rush Limbaugh days. The criticism was such that the NIV committee agreed not to publish the Bible in America. And they also agreed under pressure not to import the British version for American markets. They went on to incorporate some of those changes into a new version of the NIV in America called TNIV, Today's NIV, that came out in 2002, which was widely condemned by evangelicals for its uh, use of gender-neutral language. In 2011, they came out with a new revision of the NIV itself, which had been last revised in 1984, that incorporated some of those changes, but not nearly as many as the TNIV had made. And at the time, the publisher of the NIV admitted that they had made a mistake in earlier in the NIVI and the TNIV. They said, quote, we failed to make the case for revisions and we made some important errors in the way we brought the translation to publication. We also underestimated the scale of the public affection for the NIV and failed to communicate the rationale for change in a manner that reflected that affection. In other words, the TNIV was a failure of marketing. Even the slight changes that the NIV 2011 did make uh, were far too many for lots of evangelicals. That year, in 2011, the Southern Baptist Convention voted in their summer convention a resolution denouncing the NIV 2011 and asking Lifeway to stop selling it, saying that it contained translation errors with regard to gendered language. As for Lifeway, the SBC-related bookstore, they refused to stop selling the NIV saying, quote, we are not giving it a stamp of approval. We're simply saying from a retail perspective, we do not believe that we should cease carrying and make available to the public the NIV 2011. In other words, this thing makes money. <laughs> Even gatekeepers have to eat. This controversy over the New International Version in its various forms and over gendered language and NIV revisions... Um, caused several prominent evangelical leaders and pastors to condemn the NIV as a whole. John Piper, very um, famously. And it also led to the creation of a new translation project called the English Standard Version, the ESV, which was published in 2001 and has been revised a few times since. The ESV 
according to them, was supposed to fill a need for new literal translation as opposed to the dynamic translation followed by the NIV. As we discussed a couple of weeks ago, though, this notion of literal translation is nonsensical since words do not have meaning apart from the phrases and the sentences in which they appear. So the formal equivalent or essentially literal approach of the ESV It might stay somewhat closer to the syntax of the Hebrew and the Greek, but each translation decision is as much an interpretation as is any other translation such as the NIVs. Now, notably, the ESV is 95% identical to the old Revised Standard Version of 1952. You guys remember how controversial that one was. But they licensed the RSV for free from the National Council of Churches, which was a huge mistake by the NCC. They changed 5% of it. And then publish it now as the English Standard Version. Now, a very fun exercise is to pull up two windows like we did last week and compare the RSV and the ESV and see those 5% changes. That tells you exactly where the agenda of the translator lies. The translation decisions favored by the ESV as they move from the old RSV and against the NIV can be boiled down to two issues. First, they want a particular terms to be retained. For example, theological terms. In uh, Romans 3.25, Paul says that Jesus came as a propitiation for our sins. Well, that's the old wording. And new translations have moved away from that, saying atonement or something else. And the ESV keeps propitiation. Because, according to Leland Riken, who is a a former professor at Wheaton and an advocate of the ESV, uh, the language, he says, a quote from him, he says, the language of our Bibles must match the language of our theology books. So you can see how this preference for a particular uh, translation is driven by theological ideology, right? Um, the second area that the ESV addresses has to do with that gender inclusivity that we were talking about. The ESV avoids all efforts of modern translations to make the Bible more inclusive, both in reference to people and to God. Now, these ESV proponents like Riken and Wayne Grudem and other people like that make all kinds of theological and linguistic arguments for why they're just translating the Bible as it is. But the fact is that their translation is rooted firmly, fundamentally, in patriarchal Christian culture, American evangelical patriarchy. The communities who use the ESV, not all Christians who have the ESV, but the communities who are endorsing it and using it in a very public, political way, tend to be those congregations that prohibit female leadership in the church. They are congregations that hold so-called complementarian views of male and female gender roles in the home. Uh, They are... Communities that are distrustful of feminist or politically correct changes in culture. So, despite their claims to present the Bible literally without imposing the interpretations of the translator on the reader, which they say the NIV does, they have encoded their gender politics into the Bible itself. And since their translation method that they say they use is just to present the Bible as it is without interpretation, literally, here you go, then that patriarchal agenda gets hidden that much more powerfully. Right? It makes it much more difficult to foreground the ways in which the interests and of the translators and the publishers have influenced the wording that's used in that Bible. That the ESV is, participates in and is an expression of socio-political conflict around gender. It just is. As is the NRSV. And the NIV and all the others. So, let me pause there. Questions about the NIV, ESV, gendered language. I didn't go into a lot of the examples, but I think you probably get my idea. Questions? Okay. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Thank you. So the NIV in the 90s 
were responding to political cultural issues to try to make it more inclusive. Those who opposed those changes went back and tried to go the other way, and that's where we are. Mm, the RSV in the 50s was not great. The NRSV in the 90s was better. I mean, the, well, the R, theologically, the RSV in the 50s made some changes. The gender stuff was not on the table yet. But they had their own issues in the 50s with the RSV. Oh, right. Yeah, they didn't like the RSV back then, but they can use it now with those 5% of changes. So, again, this fall, I'm given a paper called The Bible for Liberals, in which I do this exact same analysis on Bibles for progressives. That make all these same kinds of moves, right? I mean, so this is not one. This now I do. I, I am pay attention to the difference between the way it works and how people claim it works. That can vary where you are, but the idea that translation is interpretation—that that's a universal truth. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's a circle, absolutely. So, but can you get a Bible that's, that's pure? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. As a reformed Christian, informs our theology. We take our theology from the Bible, not the rest. Right, I, I sort of reject the notion of purity as a whole. I mean, we're Calvinists in this room, are we not? <laughs> right? Sin is foregrounded in our theology, so that's important. Um, I would say the answer is not to find something pure, but the answer is to be more thoughtful, more well-informed, more critical, right? To use our rational faculties as God-given to analyze these things, to be just as uh, informed and, and thoughtful as we can be about it. And to use lots of translations. You know, there's not one that's right. I think you've got to use several uh, in parallel. Yes, in the back. Yes. We take all these uh, versions of the Bible and say they're holy inspired words of God. Mm. Sure. Sure. If you get something else out of it, how can that be? Right. Well, so uh, I'm going to talk about the theology of inspiration um, in, in detail, my views on that next week, when we start talking about the theology of Bible translation as a whole. Um, in my mind, when you're talking about inspiration, whether it's the inspiration of the text itself or the process that preserved and, and uh, passed down the manuscripts and the work that is involved in translating and producing it. Uh, theologically, we can affirm the providence of God. Theologically, we can affirm the shepherding of God over the vessels that are the means to communicate the word. Right? But that's, these are two different kinds of discourses. Um, it's not, I don't think, self-evident, but it's something that we can affirm theologically. Yes? Mm, good question. Right. 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 I think there's not, you can't start over. The K, I've argued a couple of weeks ago that there's really only one translation, which is the King James, and then everything that is trying to respond to it and revolve around it. Right. There is what the Bible is, and the further you, I'm trying to translate numbers right now for a commentary I'm writing, and even I, I feel this, where the further I get from whatever the rendering was before, the more anxious I feel. So it's very difficult to do that. So, um, forgive me because I'm from Townsville. really big words, but I think it's great that there's this, you know, like with our kids, it's wonderful to be talking about which church they're going to as opposed yes. to are they going to church? Yes. It's, mm. it's good that we're talking about which Bible you're reading uh, as opposed to, you know, are, are, you? are you on the porn site? I mean, right, you know, that's right. I think it's, it's, that's right. It's a blessing that we're having this discussion. That's right, that's right. Um, thank you for that. I think that's a good way to transition to my next point that I want to make, which is what are the changes in society? And in a way, the conversation we've been having is an insider's conversation among people who are already committed, who already know, you know, we've got Bibles on the shelf, right? Yes. Just one last question. Sure. I think it's in the year 1973, so that's my Okay. Opinion. And the Greek New Testament we had, the Nestle Greek New Testament, uh-huh. they thought was 98% accurate to the 
non-existent original manuscript. Uh, what edition was that? Do you remember? Seven. They're on 28 now. Uh, when, I was in, when I was in grad school, it was on 26. Okay. So. <laughs> well. You have something that you, you know, it's as close as you can get to the, uh, to the oldest manuscript. Right. Is that not something worthwhile? How yes. That's right. <laughs> no. Um, I will say this just briefly. In general, text critics are moving away from that kind of evaluation. And instead of talking about original, they're trying to just analyze changes that we see. Um, so people are less optimistic about that now than maybe they were. So, yes. With all of these translations, which is the infallible word of God? <laughs> which one do you read? So, uh, right. Well, I mean, you know, even, well, I'll talk about this next week, but infallible, that's kind of a problematic term. Um, you know, I think, uh, again, if, if you ask me what the best translation is, I'm going to say, find one, find two or three that have different philosophies. So one that tries to be fairly close to the syntax of the Greek and Hebrew, and a couple that do more interpretive kinds of moves openly and then compare and contrast and where they're different that's where the good stuff is that's the marrow where you see them differ that's the part you want to focus on it's like that's sort of the main um pedagogical tool i use in my teaching okay so let's talk a little bit about current trends then like where are we where are we headed well the most significant trend in contemporary english bible translation is Frequency, increasing frequency. Since 1990, there have been as many as 14 revisions, updates of the King James Bible. 14. Whole new translations are almost too numerous to mention. One stream that we've talked about is the authorized version stream, which starts with the KJV. And in America, you see the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the uh, English Standard Version, right? That's the authorized version stream that we've talked about. There's also the NIV and its versions, and they have one called the NIRV, the Reader's NIV, which is for a fourth grade reading level. It's pretty interesting. There's the Living Bible and the New Living Translation. In four, trans, four versions, God's Word, the Message, the Common English Bible, the Christian Standard Bible, the Net Bible, the New English Bible. There have been a number of Catholic translations. The Jerusalem Bible in the 50s and the New Jerusalem Bible in the 80s. The New American Bible in two versions. Catholic versions of the RSV and Catholic versions of the NRSV. There have been so many minor translations, too numerous to go into. They range from Bibles that take an extreme uh, translation approach, like super literal or more literary in style. They, Bibles that serve a particular theological viewpoint, like end times prophecy Bibles and evangelical heritage Bibles. That's one. Uh, Bibles that use particular names for God, and then that's their marketing. We're going to use this name for God. Uh, that foreground Hebrew terminology in some way that are written for very young or inexperienced English readers. Along with this proliferation of Bibles comes a certain number of Bibles that challenge the notion of what a Bible is. For instance, the voice. Anybody ever seen the voice? It's translated like a script. You have stage directions. You have characters talking in dialogue. The action Bible is formatted like a graphic novel for children and young readers. Um, There's a Bible called the God is Disappointed in You Bible, which I love. It's a humorous paraphrase with a delightfully sardonic attitude toward the text. It begins with, uh, God was lonely. And he made them the same mistake a lot of single men do when they're lonely. Is he tried to meet people, but there weren't any people. So he made some. That's how it begins. People have translated the Bible into emojis, into Klingon, into lolcats, manga, There's a conservative Bible project that retranslates the Bible in ways that support conservative principles. Capitalism over socialism. For example, Acts 2.44, they change and all that believed were together and had things in common to 
Everyone who believed was together and shared values, faith, and the truth. But not their money, clearly. There is the Jesus-centered Bible, which highlights the 700 places they say Jesus is mentioned in the Old Testament. There is the Bible Illuminated, which contains the Bible printed with text and pictures like a glossy magazine, Condé Nast, 286-page magazine. You can listen to James Earl Jones read you the King James, which I think would be hard because I'd feel like I had Darth Vader teaching my Sunday school class. There's a chronological study Bible that takes passages out of their canonical order and puts them so that you can read it in historical order, which um, as an academic, I don't believe is as easy to do as they think it is. There's a website called Top Verses, which I encourage you to take a look at because it's astonishing. Their tagline is the Bible, comma, sorted. And it lists the Bible not in canonical order, but each verse according to its popularity on the search engines on Google. Anybody guess what's number one? John 3.16. Very good. You've got, um, there's a couple of verses from the creation. But to get anything in the Old Testament, you have to go all the way down toward the, uh, well, there's Jeremiah 29, a passage that's highly misinterpreted. We talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, You have to, mostly the Old Testament passages are uh, about homosexuality. So these things are ranked according to their frequency of citation on the internet. Um, There's a a Bible called the Word on the Street Bible. Here's the opening paragraph of the Word on the Street Bible, which I actually kind of like. First off, nothing. No light, no time, no substance, no matter. Second off, God starts it all up and whap, stuff everywhere. (laughs) It says whap, W-H-A-P, all caps. So, and I would be remiss not to mention my favorite thing of all, the Brick Testament. Bible passages rendered in Lego. Now, the Brick Testament has three things about it that are genius. I've been using it in classes. It started um, early 2000s, like 2002, 2003, I started using it, back when I had to roll the computer into the classroom. First, the Lego building is wonderful, just incredibly inventive and, and beautiful. Second... The macro photography is great. These close-up images, just really artistic. And third, they use a very specific literal interpretation method that sometimes creates interesting uh, and odd moments in the depiction. So if God does something, there's an image of a little Lego God literally doing a thing. God hammers the nail that closes Noah into the ark. Um, There's a passage where it says you have to go outside the camp and bury your defecation because if God sees it he will be upset and there's this image of God walking and there's this little poo on the floor and he's got his angry eyes right (laughs) so you have these literal depictions of the biblical stories which are really great Um, the stories by the way are rated for nudity sexuality violence and cursing and if there's a story in which there are people who are having uh, sexual relations There's Lego doing that, and it's really thumping. Um, (laughs) Did you know that there was nudity and sexuality and cursing and violence in the Bible? Did you know that? (laughs) Certainly, right? Well, most of the depictions of the Bible that we have that are multimedia transformations do not depict it. This is one that can because it's Lego, right? If you did it as a live-action movie, people would be really upset. Um, There is a Brick Testament printed version that you can buy that has the violence but not the nudity in it, not the sexuality in it, right? Think about that. And the reason is this book is sitting on the shelf at Barnes & Noble and you're you're walking through and you see the Lego Bible and you think, oh, my grandson loves Legos (laughs) and he really needs to read the Bible more. I'm going to buy him the Lego Bible and then you give it to him for his birthday and then, you know, you can't have... That kind of stuff in a Bible that might inadvertently be used by children. I guess on the web, all, everything is open, you know, free season. But, you know. You may have heard of the message. Well, I like the message, generally. There's a new version of the message, the message 2.0, which is called the message remix. It has a new slim package. It has lots of extra resources in it. And the tagline is, upgrade your Bible. So here's the question. Are we all ready to upgrade our Bibles? 
What's happening here? Where is all this leading? In the past, let me preface this. The part about the ESV, mildly controversial, I think. Uh, this is also controversial. And I'm, I'm being provocative. I think I'm right. I'm asking you to think about this. And tell me what I want to hear uh, at, you know, in our conversation and next week as well, what you think about this. In the past, we, I use the word we as in literally we, mainline American Protestant Christians, experienced the Bible in narrowly defined ways. It was curated and given to us through carefully controlled channels. If you wanted a new Bible, you went to the Christian bookstore or perhaps to the retailer with the book section, you might get one from the Gideons at a hotel or like I did from the Gideons at school every year. They were giving out Gideon Bibles on the school bus. There were not many versions available and what differed mostly about them was the material and the color of their covers, maybe the size of the print. What about now? We have Amazon. We can access every translation in print and many that aren't. You can get the British printed NIV inclusive from Amazon for 10 bucks, regardless of what the evangelical publishing restrictions were. There are websites in which you can read different translations, dozens, dozens of languages, scores of translations, totally for free. There are non-free Bible applications like Accordance, which I've used last week. That gives you this amazing ability to search, analyze, compare biblical texts in all kinds of languages to use the original Hebrew and Greek. Right? This is an amazing flourishing of new tools, new access, much less curation. Some things haven't changed. I think the whole scene now is controlled by marketers and publishers as much as it was before. Even these free versions online have agreements with publishers that set out the conditions of their use. Um, the strongest versions are tied to particular publishers. For example, the ESV is published by Crossway. They're the only ones who put it out. And the, the success of the ESV is closely tied to the success of Crossway as a publishing uh, platform. They are a not-for-profit organization, right? But that doesn't mean they're not um, capitalist. Why are there so many revisions of the King James? Well, it's not in copyright. So smaller publishers can give it a go. You could do it. If you want to do your own KJV Bible, go to it. Let me know. If you finish it this week, I'd like to see it. <laughs> so many things are still the same, right? I think the, the curation is different. The avenues, the, the area, the level of control is different. But the, the publishing, the marketing, all of these elements are still the same. What's different, Really? Fundamentally, what's different? The culture's different. The religious landscape has changed. The nature of religion in America in the future will not resemble religion in America of the past. Our culture is mobile and transient in a way that it wasn't in the past, a generation ago. Our culture is diverse and secular in a way that it wasn't a generation ago. Our culture is not dominated by Protestant Christianity in the way that it was a generation ago. Now, I don't mean to reduce the Bible and uh, Bible translation or Christianity to an American context. Certainly, the growth areas of Christianity are in the global south. And you can be sure that Bible translators are working really hard to address those markets. But for the purposes of today, let's think about America. Biblical literacy is vanishing. Engagement with, knowledge of, and concern for the biblical text is very weak, even in Christian communities. I see this every semester at Furman. Of all places. Even though modern translations claim to be or desire to be universal in the way that the KJV or the authorized version was, those days are over. In fact, in their titles, when they claim to be standard or common or American or international, I think it reveals anxiety about the lack of a standard authorized text. But to have a standard authorized text, we must have a unified, authoritative religious hierarchy. I'll say that again. People feel anxiety that there is no standard text. That's why they're naming all of their Bible versions the standard Bible. 
But to have a standard text, you must have a unified, authoritative religious hierarchy, which we don't have anymore. That is gone. It's gone in Europe, where the state churches are atrophied. It's gone in America, where in different areas, Protestant and sometimes Catholic churches function as a de facto official religion. Martin Marty called uh, Baptist uh, religion the Catholicism of the South, which makes all of us Protestants, the real Protestants, right? So, congratulations. Despite Crossway's stated goal, goal, for example, to have a standard English version of the Bible, or, um, you know, what they have done is uh, put their particular views into this version, but they don't have, and nobody has, the cultural dominance they would need to really make it the standard. Not even in their own narrow theological niche. Right? This debate between NIV and ESV, this is all taking place in a very small, closed community. So I expect that as culture fragments and has a more diverse understanding of and attitude toward the Bible, we're going to see a more fragmented and diverse, polarized and polarizing approach to Bible translation, publishing, marketing. I think we're going to see more projects like the Brick Testament, like the God is Disappointed in You Bible. As the Bible becomes... And this is the part that's challenging. As the Bible becomes more of a curiosity than the defining force in our culture. Which brings me to my concluding section briefly on theology. If translation is a human activity rooted in culture, then it will reflect the changes in that culture. This is what we've been talking about. The Bible translation then will reflect the increasing secularization, fragmentation, polarization of our society. Now, in distinction from medieval Europe and mid-20th century America, there is no central theology shared by all or most of the church. As goes the culture, so goes translation. But what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the church? I hope that clever, forward-thinking Christians will engage and use all kinds of Bible translation in their efforts to bring the gospel to new generations. Just as the Bible was translated into English in order to speak to a new generation of restless Protestants in the 14th to 16th centuries, so the Bible will be retranslated now in ways that speak to a restless generation. And just as the religious authorities of, and the old fogies of the 14th to 16th centuries didn't like it, you may be sure that our own religious leaders will not appreciate many of these changes. Some might embrace them, as in the Reformation, Some will continue to use their waning power to buttress old forms and old truths. Those who oppose cultural change will continue to demand that the Bible must sound a certain way, even as the culture leaves them completely behind. So I'm going to end with this. We, we affirm that the Bible is the authoritative witness to the word of God revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In theological terms, the Bible is the vessel for our proclamation of the gospel. We affirm, that Jesus, we affirm with Jesus that wherever and however the message spreads, it is good. That while much of the seed will be choked out, still some of it will take root and grow and flower. We have old language, old forms, old structures, but we have a living God and a living word and a living spirit. And just like those old wineskins can't hold the new wine, we can't be surprised when those old wineskins burst in this quest for new translation for rewriting for recreating the bible in our own time and place it is the quest for new new wineskins a vessel in which the living word of god may spread take root in our changing times thank you